Okay, short answer. Question one. The centers of a positively charged plate of value one microcoulomb, so 10 to the negative six coulombs, and a negative point charge of value negative one times 10 to the negative six coulombs, so equal, uh, one centimeter apart, as shown in figure one. The plate is fixed and the point charge is able to move. Okay. Sketch on figure one the electric field lines between the plate and the point charge. Use at least five field lines. Okay. So short answer, question one. Uh, A. Okay. Um, and the plate is positively charged and the point charge is negatively charged. Okay. Um, what you want to do for sketching complex fields like this is treat close to each object, treat it as if it's the only object. Okay. So close to the plate, we want to work, we want to draw the field as if the, the other point charge isn't there. Um, and next near a plate, electric fields are uniform. And if it's positively charged, they point away. So we have a uniform field, which means parallel electric field lines like this. Now close to a point charge, we have electric field lines all pointing inwards. Right? So we have field lines pointing in like this. And then our job um, when we're drawing field lines is to sort of link up these two pictures. So the way I'm going to do that is something like this. Now the exact details of what this looks like are not that important. Um, some sort of uh, some sort of smooth version of that, but the basic idea is, um, and, and what the two marks are for, is that near the plate you should have field lines pointing away from the plate in parallel, and near the point charge you should have field lines pointing inwards towards the negative charge uh, radially. Okay, and then that's what your two marks are for there. Okay, uh, B. Explain what happens to the magnitude of the acceleration of the point charge as it moves as a result of the interaction with the plate. Okay. So the important thing to realize here is that this negative charge here doesn't experience its own electric field. It only experiences the electric field of the other plate, right? So from that point charge's point of view, the electric field that it's experiencing is just a nice straight uniform one, right? So this is the electric field of plate only. Right? And that's what the point charge experiences. Okay. So explain what happens to the magnitude of the acceleration as the point charge moves. Well, the electric field strength is about the density of the field lines. The density of the field lines are uniform. They're equal. So we get uniform acceleration. Okay. So our answer here is that the point charge experiences constant. Now the word constant means unchanging, but you can really nail home the point constant unchanging acceleration towards the plate. So that's explaining what its acceleration is. Let's just check the question to make sure it doesn't say why or, or really explain this. Explain what happens to the magnitude as it moves towards and as a result of the interaction with the plate. Okay, it's not worded in a way that makes it really clear that you have to say so, but let, let's be really clear about this. This is because the plate creates a uniform electric field. Okay. All right, question two. 
Right, figure two shows the path of a charged particle accelerated into a region of magnetic field directed into the page. Is the charge of the particle positive or negative? Okay, so the way I would probably approach this is I would say, let's assume it's positive. Well, then it's carrying current to the right initially. So we can use FBI, B points into the page, I points to the right, and we get an F upwards. Now, that's clearly not what's happened. This particle has been accelerated downwards. So that means our current must actually be in the reverse direction to create a force downwards in order to get this sort of effect, which means we must have a negative charge, okay? And if you want to explain your reasoning there, you can just say from Fleming's rule, which is just a fancy word for FBI. Okay. Sketch on figure two vectors that represent the magnetic force acting on the charged particle at three different points. Okay, I'm going to do this with annotations. Um, magnetic force. So not the magnetic field, the magnetic force. Well, we don't even need to know anything about magnetism here. We know that the force that's acting on this particle is pointing towards the center of the circle because it's moving in circular motion and that's what circular motion is. So we can just create a bunch of forces that point in towards the center of the circle. As many as you need, it says to do at least three. Oh, no, it says to do exactly three. So three different Forces all pointing in towards the center. We're in circular motion, so the forces must be towards the center. Okay, uh, let's see. Annotations on the video. Okay, let's see. Um, determine the size. Oh, I better get rid of that. Um, Determine the size of the force acting on the particle if it has a charge of 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19. Q equals 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19. Cool. We know that it's negative though, so there it is. Uh, it enters the region of magnetic field of value 7 Tesla. <laughs> Jesus. That is a strong electric field at a speed of 8 times 10 to the 8. 8 million meters per second. Okay, this is um, 8 times 10 to the 6 meters per second. Um, give your answer to two sig figs. Okay, so we are looking for the size of the force. Um, tell me the size of the force acting on the particle. Um, and we're given a bunch of information about its charge, the strength of the magnetic field and the speed. Um, and we sort of rack our brains for what different formulas do we know for magnetic field strength? Uh, sorry, for magnetic force, where we've got FB equals um, ILB. Uh, we don't have a current, we don't have a length of any meaning here. Okay, no, so it's not that. Um, Oh, FB equals the centripetal force here. So it could be MV squared on R because we're in circular motion. Do we know the mass? No. We do know the speed. Do we know the radius? No. Okay, so it's not that. That one doesn't work. Um, oh, okay, there's the other way we can write magnetic force, which is QVB. And we do know the charge, the velocity, not speed at least, and the magnetic field strength. So we can just plug those numbers in. Um, yeah, okay. You, you do actually want to show the substituting in here. Um, uh, you actually get marks for doing the correct substitution, not for writing down the formula, but for actually this step here where you do the substitution. Now, if you've already written them up here like this, that's absolutely fine too, but um, you've got to write them somewhere. You've got to show in order to... Um, Look, if you get the right answer, then you just get the right answer. But if they're giving you partial marks, then they need to see that you've actually done the correct substitutions, not just that you know the right formula to use. Um, okay. So, yep. So we multiply those guys together. And we get 8.96 times 10 to the... That's going to be negative 13. So, it's 
10 to the negative 14 uh, newtons. Acting on that guy. Uh, let me just check that quickly. 10 to the negative 13 and then 89.6. Oh no, 10 to the negative 12, sorry. Uh, your calculator can, can work work that out, but that's the general approach. Okay, so that's that's question two. All right, let's go to question three. Oh, nope. Oh. Just a bad bit of my book. Okay, uh, a rectangular coil is connected to a DC battery to produce a motor. Okay, so we're putting in electricity, we're getting out work. For the instance shown above, the coil rotates, but the net force acting on the coil is zero. Instance means the moment in time. Okay, so this exact moment in time. The coil rotates, but the net force acting on the coil is zero. Explain how this occurs for the coil and state the direction of the rotation. Okay, so explain how is, first we have to explain what, right? Well, the, the thing we're trying to explain here is, how can the net force be zero? but we have rotation, okay? So for question three, the key points we wanna hit are, um, well, we might as well, and we're also asked for the direction of rotation. So we might as well kind of answer these in one go. So let's work out what the forces are on these various bits first. So first we're gonna track the current. So it's coming from the positive terminal. So it's gonna go through A in here, and then it's going gonna go up on the side HG or into the page on the side HG. So let's work out the force on that side. So I points into the page, B points from north to south that way. And so the force on HG is downwards. So force on HG is down and on uh, FE is up. So straight away we can say that rotation is uh, clockwise. Um, and then now we need to explain the little bit. So we've done that part. Now we need to explain how a net force produces rotation, right? So uh, HG and FE uh, feel forces in opposite directions. and equal magnitude. Um, therefore, net force is zero. However, forces act off center. Leads to net torque, not zero. So you basically just, the three marks here are one for the direction, one for saying that the two forces on opposite sides are in opposite directions as they cancel. And then a third just for very quickly, just somehow saying this produces rotation. So that so the fact that they, they have a torque on them is one way of saying that. You could find different ways of saying it, but the basic idea is the whole thing, the whole mechanism itself isn't accelerating away in one direction or another. It's just spinning on the spot. Okay, and that's because the forces are cancelling, but they're not acting through the center of mass. Okay. That's just A. Okay. Uh, the core consists of 50 turns. The resistance of the core is 24 ohms. The battery voltage is 6 volts. The sides are blah, blah, blah. Determine the size of the force acting on EF uh, if the size of the magnetic field is 0 0.2 Tesla. Okay. Uh, show you working. Okay, so uh, we once again we want to find a magnetic force. So F equals well QVB is not going to work this time because we're not talking about individual charges and speeds. We're talking about currents. So we're going to use ILB. And because we've got multiple turns, it's going to be N ILB. So 50 turns times the current times the length times the um, yeah. Uh, so 
EF and GH are five centimeters in length. So that's going to be our L. So L equals uh, 0 0.05 meters. Um, N equals 50. B, I think we're given. Uh, B, we're told, is 0 0.02 Tesla. But we don't know I. So we need to find I using the other information we're given, but we are given the resistance of the coil and the voltage. So we can very quickly turn that into a current. So I equals uh, six volts over 24 ohms. And so that's going to be 0 0.25 amps. So now we have all four pieces of information. We just stick them in there together and um, we get it. But the only other thing is, let's just check. Sometimes they're going to ask about the all of the forces all at once. Sometimes they're going to ask about the force on FG. Sometimes they're going to talk about EF, etc. So let's just check. Determine the size of the force acting on size EF. Okay, so EF is the one we're looking at. So that's a five centimeter long side. Nothing interesting going on here. Okay. So let's do that. F equals 50. Uh, 0.25 amps, 0.05 meters, and 0.02 Tesla. Plug it all in. you get F equals 0 0.0125 Newtons. Okay, and we're done. Yeah, question four, three is done. Question four, cracking on now. Graph of gravitational field strength versus distance from Earth's center. Okay, nice one. <laughs> uh, this is not true, by the way. It, it only, anyway, all right, let's just pretend it's true. Uh, a rocket of mass 10,000 kilograms positioned at 7.3. Oh, sorry. No, no, this is fun. This, this is fun. This is absolutely fun. Uh, times 10 to the six meters from the center of the earth. So it's positioned, let me start annotating again. It's positioned here. is its initial position. The query estimates that it has enough fuel to provide it with one times 10 to the 10 joules of energy. Is the amount of energy available enough to allow the rocket to move in a straight line to a distance uh, one times 10 to the seven? So here, so we wanna know, is this amount of energy encaptured in here, uh, is that gonna be enough? Okay, so we need to work out how much work is done in moving from this position to this position here. And the way we do that is we look at the area under the graph. We want to look at the area under our force versus distance graph. We don't have a force versus distance graph here. We have a field versus distance graph. So whatever we get, we're going to have to multiply it by the, um, the 10,000 kilograms of the rocket. Okay, so let's do that. So first off, we want to, we want to count boxes here. Pretty tedious process, um, but let's do it. So I've, I've roughly counted my boxes in each little section here. Genuinely roughly. There's always a bit of leeway in, in what you can do um, here. So don't be too careful. And hopefully the number we get isn't going to be super close to this amount. Hopefully it's well under or well over. We won't have to go back and check this. But if we add up these, we get 21 plus 22, 43, uh, 50, 70, uh, 98, uh, 101, 131. 135, 145. So we've got 145 boxes times how much is each box worth? So each box is worth uh, 0.1 times a million meters. So 100,000 meters. So each box is 10 to the 5 meters by uh, 1 Newton per kilogram. So what we've got here, our total area under our graph is uh, 1.45 times 10 to the seven Newton meters per kilogram. 
Now, a Newton metre per kilogram is not a joule, so we're not finished. A Newton metre is a joule. So what we have to do is we're going to have to multiply this by some sort of mass to get there. And the mass we're going to use is the mass of the actual object that's moving. Okay. So the energy is going to be 1.45 times 10 to the 7 Newton meters per kilogram for minus 1 times 10 to the 5 kilograms because we got a 10,000 kilogram rocket. That's 1.45 times 10 to the 12 joules. And... <laughs> that is not going to be enough, not enough, enough energy, not enough energy uh, in fuel. Okay. Not by a long shot, not, not even by a factor of a hundred. So you're not even going to get, to, you're only going to be able to go another like, uh, I don't know, one hundredth of that distance. Okay. Annotations. Okay. Oh, straight away. Question five. Right. Uh, the Chandrayaan to an Indian spacecraft on scientific expedition was in orbit around the moon as part of its preparation for landing. It maintained an altitude of 123 kilometers above the surface of the moon for a while. Some relevant data calculate the period of gender and two in around the moon. Okay. So the period is going to be, um, well, it's how long you take to go around. Uh, so it's going to be two pi r the distance of a circular orbit divided by the speed that you're going at. Now, the reason I'm, the reason I'm putting it in those terms is because all of the equations I have about gravity involve circular motion. So velocities and radii and things like that. So I know that if I can find the radius of the motion and the, and the velocity of the motion, or the speed of the motion, then I'll be able to find the period pretty quickly. Okay. So how am I going to find um, these things here? Well, um, I know that V squared on R is going to be equal to um, G M M over R squared. All right. So I know, oh, sorry, just G M over R squared. Um, so I know that the centripetal acceleration here has to be equal to the gravitational acceleration. So centripetal equals gravitational. Right, I'm sure you've got formulas maybe written on your formula sheet that'll let you do this a little bit quicker, but it's kind of a the full derivation in case you don't have anything written down ready to go. Right? We know the radius of the moon, and then we know that we're another 123 kilometers above that. So uh, first off, we've got to write these two in comparable units. So how far are we from the center of the moon in our satellite? Well, we're 1.74 times 10 to the six uh, meters. And then we are 123 kilometers above that. So that's 0 0.123 times 10 to the six meters. So you can, you can check that yourselves, but, but I'm pretty sure that's right. Um, so that means we come out to 1.84 times 10 to the six meters is our radius there. Okay, so we're all, we're already almost there. Now we we know what g is. That's Newton's gravitational constant. We know what m is. That's um, that's the mass of the central body that we're orbiting. Um, so we can rearrange this equation and get v squared. Okay, so v squared is going to be g m over r. So that's Um, the mass of the moon is 7.35 times 10 to the 22. And the radius is 1.84 times 10 to the 6 meters. And we plug all that in. If you didn't know G, by the way, that's on your formula sheet as well. Uh, there it is.
So 6.67 times 2 point, sorry, sorry 7.35 uh, divided by 1.84 is 26.64 times, and then 10 to the negative 11, 10 to the 22, so that's 10 to the positive 11, divided by 10 to the 6, so that's 10 to the 5. Um, and then we're going to take a square root of that, and we get... One thousand six hundred and thirty-two uh, meters per second, and then lastly, we're going to plug that back up into our period formula. So T equals uh, so we got T equals 7,083.2 seconds. Um, and I think we're done. So 7,083.2 seconds. Uh, now, ugh, I'm not sure about that. I just want to, I just want to plug, um, I want to find out what that is in hours just because I, I just need some sort of like sense of how big that number is. So I'm just going to divide, take that number and divide it by 3,600. The answer doesn't want it in hours, but I'm just going to check. Um, okay, it's 1.95 hours, so about two hours. Uh, okay, yeah, all right. I believe that it takes maybe two hours to, uh, to orbit the moon. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't want you to just take a number and just be like, well, it came out of the formula. Um, we want to actually check it against our reasoning. You know, if this had, if that had been like uh, four years, then you'd, you'd want to be like, oh, no, that doesn't make sense. Or if it had been like, three seconds, you'd be like, oh, that's a long way to go in three seconds. Um, so you've got to have some general sense of what you're expecting um, when you get an answer like that. Okay. All right, question six. After this one, I'm going to go and get a drink of water because I'm starting to get very parched. All right. In a class experiment, a group of students set up a circuit using a fixed 12 volt RMS voltage supply and a 10 ohm resistor. Yep, nice. A voltmeter is inserted in the circuit and all the wiring is very short. No, they just mean, don't worry about the, the resistance of the wires. Um, the students record the reading of the voltmeter as 12 volts. Yep. They now alter the circuit to include 200 meters rolls of wire on either side of the power supply, connecting it to the 10 ohm resistor. Okay, so we've got a whole bunch of wire in here. The voltmeter is positioned in the same way, da da da. The 200 meter roll of wire has a resistance of 1.6 ohms. So that means we now have um, 3.2 ohms worth of, uh, worth of extra resistance in the circuit and the voltmeter now reads 9.1 volts. Provide calculations to show that the voltmeter reads 9.1 volts. I'll show you working. Okay, so we now have V equal to 12 volts RMS as we did before, but R is now 13.2 ohms, i.e. 10 ohms of the original, plus two times 1.6 ohms uh, of the roll. And so our new current is going to be uh, 12 divided by 13.2. is 0 0.909 amps, All right? And then we want to know how much voltage is actually measured by the voltmeter. Well, the voltmeter is only measuring the voltage drop on that particular part of the circuit. So V on the resistor, so this is V total, V on the resistor is going to be um, IR. So I through the resistor, times R of the resistor equals 0 0.909 amps times 10 ohms equals 9.09 .09 volts equals 9.1 volts. Okay. Um, part B, determine the power loss 
in the uh, two rolls of wire. Um, always for power loss, we use P loss equals I squared R. Uh, I is, we've seen already 0 0.909 amps. Uh, R is uh, in, we're looking for the loss in the rolls of wire. So the R of the rolls of wire is 3.2 ohms. And so our, um, so when we run that through, we get uh, 2.64 watts being lost uh, per. Um, uh, not a bad idea to annotate as you go. So this is R of uh, wire. This is um, I through wire. Okay. Okay. Describe how students could use the same circuit in figure six and any other equipment to achieve a reading close to 12 volts RMS on the voltmeter. So hopefully we all spent enough time doing this that we can remember, but uh, prior to the uh, 200 meter roll, uh, place a step up transformer. Maybe not prior, close to the source before the 200 meter rolls. Um, place a step up transformer. Um, then between the uh, wires and the 10 ohm resistor, place a step down transformer. of the same ratio. Um, describe how the students could use that circuit and any other equipment to achieve a reading close. Yeah, so it doesn't ask, explain why or talk about, it just says describe how you do it. So I think that would probably be enough. Um, I'm struggling to think what the three, I think the three marks here would be for saying where the step up transformer goes, where the step down transformer goes and the fact that they have to be the same because if they're not the same, then you might end up with 24 volts on the other side or six volts, you know, if the ratios are multiplicative. Okay. All right, I'm going to take a quick break there um, and just grab a drink of water.